The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return, sponsored by Narconon Ojai. Hello. Welcome to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. My name is Joni Siegel, and I'll be the host for today's episode. I am the host pretty much for every episode on this particular podcast, and my husband, Steve Siegel, is the producer of the podcast. If you would like to be on our podcast, if you have a story to tell, or if you have a mission that concerns the pandemic of addiction, please reach out to us. There are several ways you can reach out to us. We have a website, theaddictionpodcast.com. We have a Facebook page, The Addiction Podcast Point of No Return. We have a YouTube channel. We also have an email address, theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com. Just reach out to us. We would love to hear your story. Today we have an interview with a woman who is doing her part to educate the planet about drugs. Her name is Megan Fielkoff. And Megan is a dynamic, passionate, and engaging speaker. She's a brand ambassador, MD, and event producer. She has been reaching audiences on a local, state, national, and international basis. As an MC and host, performer, brand ambassador for nonprofit and medical organizations, she's been a host for an educational group and producer of more than 1,800 events. She has a talent for communicating messages to all ages and professions, from children to CEOs. For the past 13 years, she has been a driving force empowering kids on the truth about drugs and their human rights through her role as Executive Director for the Foundation for a Drug-Free World of the Americas Chapter and New Youth for Human Rights New York Chapter. Her mission is to protect the next generation by giving them tools to achieve their dreams, overcome obstacles, and evaluate decisions. Let's talk to Megan Fialkoff. Megan, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Well, I know that you're doing a lot of education about drugs and about human rights. Tell us about how you got here, where you are today. What's your background? So I grew up on Long Island and um, I, I run Drug Free World in New York. So a lot of people think that I'm actually from New York City. I lived in New York City for 10 years, but I'm actually from Long Island, which is a completely different world and culture. And um, really never thought I would be doing what I'm doing today at all. Um, but as I got older and I, I benefited from a lot of really great things in life, I, I grew up in a great area and so on, um, I started to realize that, especially when I moved into the city, that it was really important to make this world a better place as maybe, um, however that sounds, because I'm sure people have said that before, but I just had kind of looking around and, and being more exposed to the world and having traveled, I saw that there were a lot of places that were really not in good shape and people were not leading good lives. And I really started to want to do something that was going to help change the world. And so that's kind of how I got involved. It wasn't, you know, some people think that I'm in this position because maybe I have my own story with drugs or maybe there was something that was very traumatic that happened in my life in that along those lines. But actually that's not why I do it. I do it because I know it makes a difference. And I know, I know, especially in my later years of running this program that it's needed more than ever. So. Right. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. We kind of have the same thing with the podcast. Um, I, I was just telling a woman that I was interviewing yesterday that we don't have anybody in our family that's addicted to drugs. But when we started podcasting, we, specifically Steve, looked at what is the biggest societal problem facing the planet today. And he said, drugs. And I'm so passionate about it, as I know you are as well, because it, it, is, it is such a big problem. And I'll tell you something else I've been saying recently, because... You know, we're recording early May. This will go up in June. 
And so we're starting to ease off of the whole coronavirus, but there's been so much attention on the coronavirus and the big deal that it is. And when the coronavirus situation has gone away, there's still gonna be an addiction pandemic. It's still there. And it's just, yeah, I'm, I'm passionate about that. And I don't have my own personal experience with drugs either, but I just see too much of it. Yeah, well, and also I don't have the exact number but I believe in one of the last years, there were 70,000 people that died in the United States from drugs. So um, that is kind of an epidemic, you know? So they're, they're, the one thing that I've felt throughout this entire coronavirus and what I'm hoping people will start to see from this is that it is important for us to have good health and to take care of our bodies. And if we don't want things like this to happen, then we really need to address that. And to think that having a whole generation of kids mentally addicted to pot because it's so easy for them to access, I'm not really sure how that's not gonna be a huge global health crisis. So, I'm hoping that people start to look at it that way from if, if they get something out of all of this, that it's, we do have to take better care of ourselves and our bodies and not leading such stressful lives and so on. So I agree. And I think that there is so much misinformation out there about marijuana. And we've said it over and over again on the podcast the marijuana of today is not the marijuana of the 70s. It's not what your parents are familiar with or your grandparents, depending on your age. It's, it's a different ball game today. And, you know, you got to know what you're putting in your body. You have to do that. Yeah. Well, also, it's a, what I was thinking when you were talking about also with the coronavirus. Sorry, just got like. <laughs> A whole chain reaction. That's okay. That, you know, we've come to, well, actually, this is when you were talking about the addiction, is that this is a, it's not just drugs that's an issue. This is like an overall, people need to fully kind of revamp their lives. And you see this a lot in when, you know, I'm 35 years old, so I follow a lot of certain types of social media, like people on Instagram, right? And I tend to follow a lot of people that seem to lead very healthy lives and they eat really well and they take care of themselves and they're very on trend or up to date on, on beauty and all these various things. And what it really comes down to is it's a whole, it's a whole thing. It's not just, it's not just about not using drugs. It's about how we're eating and how we're taking care of our bodies. And it's a whole entire shift that is happening you know you see lots of people who have seen the documentary fork overnight and then they become vegan or you know they there, there's so many documentaries on netflix and it's getting people to look and change how they what what's acceptable and what's questioned and what's not questioned but this is a whole subject you know people it, it it's a whole thing that they have to do to get their their mind and their bodies and gear to feel better, which includes not being addicted to drugs, but it also includes other things that will make you feel good so that you don't then go back to using drugs. Exactly. So tell me the background, the history, changing the subject here. Tell me about Drug Free America. How did it start? What are its main activities? Sure. So um, Foundation for Drug Free World is a nonprofit. And before it became its own nonprofit corporation type of legal entity, there were a lot of grassroots activities that were taking place for probably 20 years before the actual nonprofit was formed in 2006. I'm going to and, stop you because I made a big error. There's another yeah. organization called Drug Free America. And that's we're not, I heard it. Don't and worry. we're not talking about that. We're talking about Drug Free World because we've had Amy Rongshausen on several times talking about <laughs> Drug Free uh, America and probably the marijuana discussion probably led me down that road. Anyway, Drug no Free World. There you yes. go. Yes. 
that's okay. I, I have people do that all the time and it's not a problem. It's interesting because I don't really hear that much from them anymore. So I, I, I don't see any newsletters that they send out and so on. Maybe I'm just not on their list anymore for some reason, but I don't know what they're up to. Uh, unfortunately, the only other nonprofits that I know about, that which are very few, that are major national nonprofits that are supposed to be on drug prevention, have completely changed gears into just promoting about addiction being a disease and getting your addiction treated. And uh, we're, we're sticking true to the integrity of our organization, which is prevention and education. But it isn't that interesting, Megan, because I know that there's a whole push on the part of the psychiatric profession to label addiction as a brain disease, because then the only valid therapy is a drug to right. substitute for another drug. But I just find that interesting that a lot of these organizations that have, you know, have as their purpose to educate people about drugs or just even pr drug prevention, drug addiction prevention, and they're not doing what drug free world does. Yeah, I don't really see much of anyone doing what we do anymore. Um, you know, I'm a huge, and I'll, we'll get back to your question about how Drug Free World got started in a second, I, I won't forget, but I wanna comment on what you just said. So I'm a huge advocate of education really empowering you. And as a, oh, I, I like to call myself a girl, as a girl, <laughs> I don't say I, as a woman, as a girl, I, um, you know, it took me so many years to learn how, what looks nice on me, how to look nice, how to feel good and so on. And it really all comes down to education. And if people had educated me from a young age on what colors look well on you, how, how do you do your hair? How should you dress? Um, how do you socialize? How do you, where should you go to college? Like all these various things, it all comes down to education and people teaching you. And so I, I really believe in that. Like if someone just kind of was like, well, you don't feel good about how you look. So, you know, you just need to take this pill or something like, you know, and that's not the subject of today's podcast. Cause that, you know, this is more of a personal story, but that wouldn't have helped me, you know, what would have helped me was someone taking the time to sit with me and show me how to, how to be more of what I want to be. And that's an, that's a lifelong thing. You know, last night I spoke to one of my friends who is the author of a, a book on how to have uh, the French metabolism or something like that. Ah, okay. Yeah, I, I can recommend it to you after. It's amazing. Okay. And um, this, I, just, I read, I, I hardly really read that many old books anymore, but I was flying when, right before everything closed down and I was flying from Denver to California. So it's a relatively short flight. And I read the whole book in two hours wow. and I never do that. And so, but it's, what I'm trying to say is it was a whole, I learned so much about uh, eating and, and, you know, everything that goes into that and, and exercise and the whole mentality behind people who are thin. And the whole point of what I'm trying to say is it's a, that's, and that's why people watch, follow people at Instagram and so on. In some way, they're trying to get educated on something to be a better version of themselves. And so same thing with us, with, with Foundation for a Drug-Free World, I really believe that if we, especially because I do so many events in, in the inner city schools, if that we respect these kids enough and respect these parents enough that they deserve to be educated and that they can lead a more, a better life. They don't have to just be addicted to drugs for the rest of their lives and somebody tell them that this is normal or that this is this is how life is. I don't agree with that. And so that is, so I'm really happy that we stick with education and prevention because there's no substitute for education and taking the time. You know, a lot of this is like, what's the quick fix? What's the quick fix and so on. 
But what I've learned in life is whenever I try to just like do something really fast and not right the first time, you always end up going through so much and having to end up doing it right the first time. You know, like if you quit a job the wrong way or if you rush something in a breakup or whatever it is, you regret it and you end up having to do it right all over again. So other, so, so, so with kids, let's just take the time to educate them the right way in the beginning and avoid all of this other nonsense and let them, you know, I just did a whole webinar on how you deliver a drug free world event. And it's not just about educating them on drugs, but it's also inspiring them to, to have goals in life and to achieve their goals in life. And this is, it's a whole other talk I could give, but that's a huge part of our program is also inspiring them to feel like they can do something with their lives and to work towards that. So anyways, I think, I, I think that's huge. And I also want to make the point because I'm very familiar with the truth about drugs materials. And I'm going to digress for a second. I'm, I'm heavily into nutrition and have been for a long time, but Adele Davis, for example, I find her very difficult to read because she is extremely scientific in what she talks about. And I have to skip down to where she says, drink orange juice. I'm like, okay, I'm going to drink orange juice. <laughs> but the thing about the truth about drugs, and I've, I've watched the interviews and I can't say that I've read every booklet cover to cover, but they're very easy to understand. They're yeah. hard hitting because the truth is hard hitting, but they're very easy to understand. And if you cannot read the booklets, there's videos, you can watch the videos. And I agree with you 100%. You know, it's one thing when you say to kids, just say no, just don't do it. That's actually like waving a red flag at a bull. And you know, when you tell a kid, no, 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 their thing is like, well, then I'm gonna do it. But if I firmly believe, and you have the evidence to back it up, that if you give a young child the truth about something they will understand and they will make the right choice. I believe it. Yeah. 100%. I agree. And, it, and it, it transcends many subjects. You know, I worked in Queens, New York for a long time. That's where our office is based. But even separate from Drug Free World, worked in that area and saw a lot, a lot, a lot of girls who had children um, in high school. And now they're in their 20s and they're single moms and they're not really surviving. They're not doing well. And it's odd because it doesn't even seem like it bothers them. I guess they're so used to it. But that's a whole other, it's the same thing. Like people might say, no, no, no. Uh, maybe someone would have a disagreement on educating kids, let's just say. But then let's be the devil's advocate. And it's like, well, should we just not educate teenage uh, girls and, and guys on like what would happen if they did have kids in high school and what's going to happen to their future. No, these things need to be talked about or like the nutrition in schools, like what types of, it's so funny. I, I usually only food shop at Whole Foods, but because of this whole coronavirus, I've gone everywhere to try to find things. I'm sure. And there's this rest, uh, grocery store that's, you know, just a regular one. And I went down the cereal aisle and I literally saw a Hershey's Kisses cereal. <laughs> it was little Hershey Kisses, like, but it, I guess in an oat form or something, I'm not even sure, but for <laughs> breakfast. And I was like, oh my God, there are kids eating this as their breakfast and going to school. Or even before this whole thing happened and Starbucks was still open, um, sometimes I go at the wrong time when all the kids are there before school and they're all getting these huge frappuccinos and, you know, and I'm guilty. I ate horrible in high school too. You know, I would get chocolate <laughs> croissants and I would have frappuccinos and so on. But when I was growing up, my mom really, um, didn't give us sugary cereal and so on to, for the most part, but all of these things are educational things. You can't just say, no, no, don't educate, you know, like that just doesn't make sense. You have to on all of these subjects. It's the yep. only way people are gonna know better. The only reason why a mom would give their kids Hershey Kisses for cere uh, cereal for breakfast is clearly 
she's missing some kind of education. Yep. Yep. And I think along those lines as well, because we're kind of randomly talking here, yeah. you know, <laughs> a lot of times, you know, parents are told to use this or that drug for mm -hmm. their child or for yeah. themselves. And we've talked about it over and over again on the podcast. You have to educate yourself on what that drug is and what the side effects are. I had a, there's a woman here in Clearwater that is a pharmacognosist, which means she studies medicinal herbs, but she's also a pharmacist. She's a fully licensed pharmacist. And she was just talking about painkillers. And if you sprain your ankle, what you want to take is a painkiller that will help handle the inflammation and pain in the ankle, not something like Oxycontin that affects the whole nervous system. You don't need that, but wow. that's an education point. Right. And it does come down to um, this kind of mass operation of mass everything because of saving money and what's the fastest way to do it and so on. It does, it's kind of like the doctor, we've set up a system where because of insurance and then they don't pay the doctor well, then the doctor can only see you in five minutes and then they just have to, everything has to be so fast and very cookie cutter and, you know, and, and so it's, this is why I keep saying it's not just one area, it's a whole system that has to be kind of broken out of. Yep. Um, yeah. You're correct. So what part of the country do um, drug-free world lectures happen in? Okay. Or the so, world for that matter. Well, and this, I'll use this question to also answer the original question of how did it get started? Okay. So, um, uh, so drug-free world as an actual nonprofit entity was formed in 2006, which was also the year I graduated college. So, it's, uh, and that's when I started the chapter with my dad, Dr. Uh, Bernard Bielka, um, in May of 2006, right when I graduated. And it was a pretty much a brand new nonprofit, but it had all of the, most of the materials that you see now, like the curriculum, which is a spiral bound with lesson plans, booklets that cover each drug, posters, a documentary DVD, and so on. I don't know if the DVD was released at that point, but if not, it was very close to that when the nonprofit was formed. And so we started out, um, each chapter is obviously has slightly different activities that they do and how often they do it. You know, we're all volunteers. Um, I'm a volunteer. I am the executive director, but I am a volunteer. Um, you know, we would like to move it more into getting grants and so on so we can get more of a structure in that regard. But that's, you know, we're still a baby nonprofit. We're working on that. Um, but there's nonprofits, uh, there's chapters all over the world. So you have them in Japan and a Taiwan, Australia, France, and so on. And I've met a lot of these people because I've traveled to a lot of these places to um, deliver events, um, not to educate them on drugs, but to help them to get going with their own chapter. And our chapter mainly has focused on events. Okay, Some chapters focus on booklet distributions, like getting out as many booklets in, a, in, in their area or community or city, which is very grassroots and um, doesn't take a lot of time and you can kind of do it whenever you want. So that's a really great way to get started. We only do that maybe once or twice a year, like in Times Square, usually as part of like a day, like a, the national day of blah type of thing. But, um, and when we had some billboard, electronic billboards in Times Square, we did a book of distribution when we premiered those. But you just we, reminded me, Megan, that we had uh, Marshall Falk on the podcast and it was right before Super Bowl. And then I know there was a huge distribution of the Truth About Drugs booklets at Super Bowl. So I had to chime in with yes. that. Yes. Yeah. Like hundreds of thousands. I think they gave out 750,000 or a million. You are listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information on the podcast or to reach out if you have a story you would like to share with us, go to our Facebook page by the same name, or you can email us at theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com, or go to our website, theaddictionpodcast.com, or call us at 727 314 
7080. And please remember to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star review. For more information on our sponsor, Narconon Ojai, visit their website at narcononojai.org. That's N-A-R-C-O-N-O-N-O-J-A-I.org. Or call 1-866-231-5924. That's 1-866-231-5924. Sometimes, the hardest thing about getting someone into recovery is getting them to agree to treatment. Bobby Newman, a certified drug counselor with 30 years experience and an over 85% success rate as an interventionist, has created a series of 12 videos that you can use right now to learn every step to get your loved one to agree to treatment. Call 1-833-918-0008 today and say the word podcast to get a 10% discount. Or go to newmaninterventions.com and type in the word podcast for a 10% discount. This service comes with a free one-hour consultation with Bobby. This has happened in London too. I believe last year was the London Olympics. That's right. They gave out a million. Wow. That's incredible that that's usually managed by international drug free world. Yes. So, um, because they bring people from all over to help, which obviously that would be necessary. Um, our chapter again has spoke. So we started out saying, okay, there are 2,200 schools in New York city. We want to do an event at all of them. That's how we started. So, what, and then we quickly soon found out that every school also had an after school program. And we started out actually reaching out to the after schools because we figured it would give us more practical experience and so on. And we got a list and we did our own mailing and we just started getting tons of events booked. And I, that's how I learned the subway system in New York because I literally <laughs> just had a carry on suitcase. I would print my directions from this website called hopstop.com, which I don't even think exists anymore. And I would just get on the subway and go. And I learned so much and changed so much from that first year because the subway rides and the changes as you, as you pass certain streets and you uh, start to really head towards, let's say the Bronx or Brooklyn, you really see the changes on the subway. That was really eye opening for me. Um, and then getting out and seeing the difference in the city and what, what the stores are like. And there's, it's amazing. And then you go into these schools, these after schools and, you know, some of these first events that I did, I, you know, some of the schools have uniforms for the kids. And I remember doing an event for like fifth graders and they were so excited and bright and listening. And they had these like sweaters, the uniform of the sweaters. And I remember looking at the sweater of this one girl and saying like, where does this girl go home to? Who's taking care of this girl? And just, I can't explain it, but it was such a moment for me. And that really has made it so worthwhile looking. I don't just give an event and look at these kids as like a mass of students and just, you know, read off a script. Like we really look at all the kids and really try to get them involved. And you really see that most of them are really, really good and you hope someone's taking care of them. You just don't know. And so right. anyway, so that's how we started was doing events. And in schools primarily. Yeah, after schools, schools. And then as we grew, we were invited to present um, like with the New York City Department of Education, which is responsible for all the schools in New York City. They have different departments within their structure and we started being invited to present to substance abuse counselors uh, special ed teachers um different uh, all the schools so i did an event once for like all the school social workers and school psychologists at a college in brooklyn for hundreds of them so we started to be able to reach people more at a higher level so we could get those people to then order the materials and use it themselves and then then we also started to get invited to government events where we were asked to be a keynote speaker. You know, the New York Senate Task Force on Heroin and Opioid Abuse. The name has kind of changed every year. We have been invited to be a speaker 
um, at those panels. And so it just, you know, when you, it's kind of like, I don't know if it was Kevin Costner in Field of Dreams where they said something like, if you build it, they will come. I don't know if it was that map movie. Yes. But, okay, good. Such a great movie. Um, kind of the same concept. Like we just started this, we built it and you meet people and then you get referrals. And the, um, the best part about running this program in New York City that we have as an advantage over all the other chapters around the world is there's thousands and thousands of like community organizations, health fairs, nonprofits, youth organizations, and there's events going on all the time. So the, there's no limit on who you can work with in New York City with our program. It's just unbelievable. You know, I feel bad for some of these other places. Let's say they're in Kansas or something. It's like, yeah, maybe there's like, I don't know, 100 schools and like 20 different after schools. And that's it. And that's what they have to work with. It is pretty limited. This is, it transcends, it's all... It's all the boroughs. And then you have Hoboken, New Jersey, Jersey City, uh, Newark. Like you have all these mini cities, Yonkers, Long Island. Well, that's Long Island City's Queens. But you have all these places that have their own cultures and their own systems. And there's so many places you can go. Right. Megan, in, in the different organizations that you talk to, I was just going to say you never run out of audiences. But in the different organizations, have you talked to actual parents like groups of parents absolutely and hold on i just want to plug in my charger okay okay sorry about that so um well let me ask you a question so i'll just ask it again then i know how to yeah. cut it so I'm curious if you have addressed these material or used these materials to address parents. And if so, what kind of feedback do you get from them? So we definitely have uh, presented to parents quite a bit um, in Brooklyn, Bronx, Queens, Manhattan, and they're all very generally concerned. Um, no one seems to really know what to do. And there's this wave of just pushing drugs into society and normalizing it. And now you have these kids uh, smoking uh, joints or whatever on Vaping. their way to school. But, and the teachers are on the same route, like walking on the same streets and the kids are smoking before school. Like it's so, it's just crazy. And, and then you have these mixed messages that the parents, the teachers and the kids are getting, which is, uh, we're educating on drugs, but then the politicians and the government and the media are saying how drugs are fine and the artists and the Hollywood and it's crazy. And the truth is it's so easy um, to just flippantly say, oh, you know, like some celebrity or something maybe who uses drugs, just saying whatever they wanna say, but they're not the ones who are living in the projects having to work all day, commute on the subway, maybe two hours, which is how long it can take to some of these places, and then having to go home and who's been watching the kid for the last four hours since they were let out of school and they're smoking pot and you're trying to be a parent and it gets, it's way overwhelming and stressful. And so it's so easy for a politician or someone just to stand up there and say something, but in a day-to-day -day life of people and what they're going through, that's a different story. And I don't think people are really looking at that. And that's something that we really look at with Drug Free World because we're really working with the people and with parents who have kids or spouses or other people who are living in these housing developments like we have in New York City all over. Um, they're, they're really dealing with that and it's real and they need help. And so we really try to obviously empower them with education and obviously get them to get the teachers to use our program so that the schools have access to drug education since our program is free and can start teaching these kids at a young age, which is what is necessary. You have to really get to them before high school, before seventh and eighth grade. It has to be done in like sixth grade. And that's right. and that's... that's uh, what we see.
Right. You said something very key, and that is that these materials are free. How yes. do people get these materials? Okay, so all of our, so we have a curriculum. That's the core of our program. And the curriculum has lesson plans, which each lesson plan has, covers a specific drug. So let's say there was just a school that has had a specific problem, let's say with heroin, ecstasy, and synthetic drugs, right? They could do a modified version of the curriculum where they only use those lessons because there's a lesson on ecstasy, there's a lesson on heroin, there's a lesson on marijuana and so on. And so uh, they can order that curriculum for free online and have it shipped to them physically like a box that has the curriculum, the corresponding booklets for each student, the posters and the video. However, they can also do a, the virtual academy, which is on our website, drugfreeworld.org, where they can have the kids sign up on the website and they can oversee the kids doing the lessons online. Wow, that's They're, helpful right now when kids can't go into school. That's, that's awesome. It's unbelievable. And we've had this before this happened. <laughs> that's smart. But, yeah. But and for the, homeschoolers, because there's a lot of there's a lot of moms out there who are homeschooling, and I was just thinking about that. Like they don't have thirty students, but they want to educate their kids about drugs, so they could just do it online. Yeah, and but there is a third option that they could do, which is e courses, where drug free excuse me, drug free world will read the lessons for them. So it's separate from the virtual academy, which is the teacher kind of monitoring all of this themselves. And then you have an e-course where a person can just go on, sign up, and Drug Free World will grade the lesson for them. Because I think, you know, we talked about the importance of educating kids so that they don't do drugs. But the other aspect of this is if I were homeschooling my kids, maybe, you know, for whatever reason, I'm fairly certain my kids are not going to get into drugs because mine didn't. But if they're educated, they can educate their friends. They can educate other kids. They will know about drugs. And when someone goes, oh, you're just not cool or whatever, they could say, no, I don't want to lower my IQ by smoking marijuana. Right. You know? Yeah. Edu kids educating kids. That's my Absolutely. point. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, in my school, it was interesting. Um, there were a lot of kids that smoked pot and maybe experimented on other drugs. But there were also a lot of kids that didn't do drugs. And a right. lot of really, uh, like, girls that I looked up to my age who were my grade who didn't really do bad things. So there's also this concept that all kids want, are going to want to do drugs or are going to want to, you know, be promiscuous or whatever. But from my experience, that was not true. And it wasn't, you weren't looked up to because you were doing drugs at all. Right. And I see now when I look back on it, like two girls that I knew who never were really into that, who have great lives and so on. And they were really close with their parents, like their parents, um, they were, their parents obviously were their parents. They had to, they, they were the, you know, more of a higher figure than the kids. They weren't on the same level, but at the same time, they were also friends with their kids and the kids respected them and they respected the kids and they just had a relationship. And those, like, so those kids didn't end up feeling the need to go out and lie to their parents or hide from their parents and do drugs. Right. And, and then, and I know these people through high school, college, and now as adults, and that never changed. You know, funny example, one of them is this girl who, all, I remember we all went on spring break senior year of high school to the Bahamas and everyone's laying out in the sun getting burnt or tan and peeling and ridiculous, right? This was like the thing. And there was this one girl, the same girl who I always sticks out, who was a beautiful girl and never did drugs and so on. And also her mom was like, no, you don't want to get wrinkles. You're going to wear suntan lotion. Like, and she was like, my mom would kill me if I got burned, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I look back at it and I'm like, you know, this girl listened to her mom because she had a good relationship with her mom. So yeah. so there's also this concept that, that all kids are going to do this, but that's not true. Also, a lot of them are not interested. Right. Um, right. And, and yeah. Or I was just going to say that I think, you know, the other thing, because I think that a lot of our listeners are parents 
or family members who know someone who is addicted. And, you know, it's the parents and the loved ones need to get educated as well. And these materials, they're free. You know, you can go online to drugfreeworld.org and, and learn about the drugs. You know, it's like I was saying before, you know, pretty much anything I told my boys not to do, it, it, they kind of sort of wanted to try it, you know, yeah. <laughs> because mom said not to do it. But they also listened when I educated them with the truth about different things. And yeah. I think that if parents can actually educate their kids with true facts, and I got to tell you that, uh, you know this, but the documentary that is available as part of the Drug Free World curriculum, it's very hard hitting. These are people who, um, you know, they were, they were selling drugs, they were taking drugs, and they have long-term health problems because of the drugs. It's very hard hitting. Oh, so yeah. There's, there's such good information there that parents can use. Yeah. I mean, part of, part of what is part of why these videos are so good is that um, it really shows what happens when you start abusing drugs, meaning people lose everything. They lose their car. They lose their relationships. They lose their college uh, career. Let's say they were an athlete in college, and then they get kicked out of the program. They, it's not what you see in the song that you hear, you know, it's not in the rap music video, no. to be honest. And uh, it's very different. A heroin user is stealing his mom's wedding ring to pay for his next batch of heroin. That's what a heroin user is. There is no, there is no sustainable heroin user. There is no uh the heroin user being part of the community which is something that's being pushed right now like that the the drug user is part of the community and should be embraced by the community this is this that's not it just doesn't work out that way it's like if someone goes around stealing from people's houses to pay for their next drug addiction that's not a, a person that's contributing to the community that's and right. so that's something for people to realize is that's what happens when a person gets addicted to drugs. Like it's, um, it's, it's like a concentric circles and it, it starts with the person, but the amount of people that get upset and stressed out from this, it just expands. The parents can hardly work. They're so preoccupied and worried about their kid. And then it expands to their friends and the school and the community and it just causes all the strain and stress and it grows as opposed to someone who's not doing that, who's maybe doing something constructive to help the community is creating the opposite effect. And that's what we need more of. Right. Exactly. Megan, you do a big event every year that acknowledges people who are working in this area. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So, Every year, our chapter of Drug Free World hosts an annual Drug Free Hero Awards Gala every May or June. Uh, this year was going to be our 13th annual gala, which has been postponed to next May. It will be May 6, 2021. And we basically honor community leaders, artists, athletes, teachers, nonprofit directors, and so on with the Drug Free Hero Award for the guys who really have their sleeves rolled up, are in the community educating um, kids on drugs or doing prevention and awareness activities. And it's grown so much. We started in 2007 doing this gala and maybe there were like 75 people there the first year. And last year we had 350 people attending. We had something like 18 awardees, wow. all unbelievable people. And it brings together just really the people in the community who are really doing something about this issue who really care. It's like a very unique event because a lot of charities, when they host their annual galas, it's really more about um, just kind of putting on a big party for the sponsors and the board. And so that's kind of what it's about. Our gala isn't like that. It is really the guys in the community who, who 
would never get an award, who would never right. be exposed to this kind of gala. We try to bring it, we make it really nice and really at a certain level so that these people can be acknowledged for what they're really doing. Not for exactly. The- it, yeah. It's all about acknowledgement. And I think that so often, you know, these people don't get acknowledged for all the work that they do in the community. I know. It's unbelievable. That's why they're so, you know, for some of them, this is, it's a huge deal. You know, we have like a red carpet and they bring their family. And one girl last year came in like a huge gown and like, it's a big deal for them. And, and it's really important. These people are the ones who are actually really working with the kids. They need to be acknowledged for their work and they are making a difference. So, yeah. That's awesome. That's, a, that's awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that you do that. Yeah. So once again, Megan, if someone wants to get a hold of these materials, how do they do that? Okay. So if they want to uh, get our free booklets or our free curriculum, they go on drugfreeworld.org. Um, they can get bulk booklets to hand out to the school in the community. Um, if they want to implement the curriculum, they can order it there. Or if they want to just do it online, they can also do a virtual academy or e-courses on drugfreeworld.org. And that's where everything is, drugfreeworld.org. If somebody wants to donate to our chapter, we would greatly appreciate that. Or if they're interested in sponsoring, our local website for my chapter is drugfreeworldamericas.org. And so Americas with an S at the end, dot org. Okay. And you can donate there. Uh, you can get my email address there on the contact page, and we will get back to you right away with what you're interested in doing. Awesome. Now, if someone um, wanted a speaker, they could find that as well at Drug Free Org. They could reach out there. They can reach out, yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, so Megan, if you had one message to give to our listeners, what would that be? The message is, is you really can do what you want in life. You can create the life that you want, and you don't have to do what everybody else is doing or what everybody says they're doing what you should be doing. At a certain point in life, you have to make your own path. You have to be your own person. And the biggest thing in life is being strong enough to be able to do that. And if your kid is using drugs and you're trying to help them, or if you're here because you don't want your kid to get involved in the first place, the best thing you could do is help them to figure out really what is their goal in life? What do they want to do with their life? and help them to accomplish that. And that will give them a feeling of self-worth, of, of importance in this world, of a place in this world. And that's a, something that we hardly do nowadays, but will make a huge difference in the future of the youth in our country. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today, Megan. Yes, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I really hope you found Megan's interview educational. That's what she's about drug education, addiction prevention, it's all needed. You know, we've talked about rehab and treatment. We spend a lot of time on that and we've even delved into law enforcement. But really, I think, I personally think the most important thing is to educate the young people. And I think that if we do it with the truth, the truth about drugs, that they will listen and they will get it and they will understand. It's what I used with my sons. It's what I know other parents have used with their kids. It makes a difference. Drugfreeworld.org, the materials are free. Please take advantage of it, and we'll talk to you again next week. You have been listening to The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return, sponsored by Narconon Ojai. For more information on Narcanon Ojai, call 866-231-5924 or visit www.narcanonojai.org. Narcanon is a non-12-step rehabilitation program based on the works of L. Ron Hubbard.